Hello again, and welcome to the Comics Online Podcast, Season 15, Episode 8. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Flashback Comics and Games here in Woodbridge, Virginia. I am Troy David Phillips, manager here at Flashback Comics, and with me yet again today, by the grace of the gods of all comics, Kevin Goswan, ComicsOnline.com. Everything, Everything geek, geek pop, pop culture. culture. Oh, and t- oh, today I'm wearing my Avengers shirt from uh, 2011, 2012. Yeah, 2012. It, uh, yeah, was, May. I think it says May. Whatever, May third, May fourth. I'm, uh, I'm checking uh, the the size. I think that'll fit me. No, no, you're too. You're far too large and in charge for this one. Uh, yeah, see that? See that? This is actually the the San Diego Comic Con uh, version. Uh, they they eventually released this. People could buy this same shirt in like uh, stores and stuff. If I tase you and take that one, then I'll have it. You could get away with that temporarily. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But not in the long run. Villains never win in the long run. Really? Um, why don't you tell Lex Luthor that? <laughs> oh, wait. You don't read Justice League. Ah, uh, well, <laughs> I would tell Lex Luthor that, but the, then there's this new 52 garbage that I'm just not interested in. You know, after today, after the Marvel uh, announcements today, and by the way, l- listeners and watchers, please please do feel free to, to cut over to part two of this after you're done with this episode, this, this portion of the episode, because we're going to talk Marvel. Oh, yeah. Marvel Cinematic Universe is just blowing up. It's going it's crazy. It's amazing. But the Cinematic Universe depends on a solid foundation of comics. True that. And we're going to get started on comics. Uh, Kev, you ready? I'm ready. Oh, wow. Check that out. He just flipped right over. Me, I was already there because I'm all about the comics. He's all comics all the time. All comics all the time. I'm 95 television, movies, I'm all over the place. Hey, 95 long boxes and counting. <laughs> and I'm not even the biggest in the country. No. But, you know, we'll talk about that in another segment. He's, he, he's, just, he's just the tallest in this building. <laughs> so, here we go, Kev. You ready for this? I'm ready. I'm going to start out touting a title from DC Comics. First and foremost, I'm sure everyone has noticed who Ooh, that's my, a delicious plastic ring you're sporting there. Uh, this is my replica of the Legion of Superheroes Legionnaires flight ring. So you can fly now? Um, if I, you're suddenly plastic, you can fly now? I have promised not to use this for my own personal gain. I can only use it for good. See? Heroes, not villains. Justice League United, annual number one, bringing back the much-loved Legion of Superheroes. Okay, <clears throat> for those of you who don't know, and I don't know who that is in the, in the world anymore, the Legion of Superheroes is a team of teenaged, super-powered characters set in the 30th century. Um, originally appearing way back in the days of Adventure Comics, Superboy and the Legion of Superheroes, etc. They did have a shot in the New 52. We had the Legion of Superheroes, the Legion Lost, and Legion Secret Origins, which debuted with the first wave of uh, New 52 comics. Uh, Secret Origins ended first. That was actually intended to be a limited series in the first place. Uh, Legion Lost and the Legion of Superheroes were unfortunately ended. They didn't make the cut. They were replaced by other things. Uh, In the future, we now have the adventures of the Justice League 3000. Talk about that book some other time. But Justice League United is giving us the Legion of Superheroes. Um, And I am excited to see these 30th century teens back in the pages of comics again. Been loving this comic ever since I was actually a kid myself. Uh, I I actually read a Superboy that featured the Legion of Superheroes. As did I back in the day. Now, is this, New 52 wise, is this uh, the, the, the current Legion time traveling back to the uh, the, the 2014 New 52 universe? Uh, well, that's a story detail I don't quite have yet. I haven't cra- quite cracked into that. I was too busy getting into the Neil Edwards artwork and checking out things like mon a Daxamite, versus John Jones, the Manhunter from Mars. That two-page spread was just freaking awesome. Here's another pa- two pages of freakish awesomeness. Um, 
The Legion of Superheroes is an enormous team, and I'm really, truly hoping that this is the first installment <clears throat> of seeing them brought back in a huge way. I would love to have their book back on the stands. I would love to see these characters get some play. A lot of interesting things well, they're teenagers, come. so would they. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, oh, my goodness. See, people, you can't take him anywhere. No. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Justice League United Annual Number 1. You should check that out. If you know who the Legionnaires are, you should be excited about this. If you don't know who they are, come check this out. Uh, a crossover with the Justice League United. And this book has really been good of late. Thank you, Jeff Lemire. Uh, the writing by Jeff Lemire has been really good on this. So, so I wanted to ask you. So you're, you're a big. I know you're a big uh, uh, Legion of Superheroes fan. What's your what, what's your favorite uh, uh, creative team over the over the years? Um, I actually have. A top three. All right. Uh, but the one thing they all have in common is Mr. Paul Levitz of all DC right. Comics. Paul Levitz wrote what I thought were some of the best Legion stories of all time. And, yeah, that includes the very, very awesome stories by Jim Shooter and a great many other people. No offense to any of them. But Paul Levitz and Keith Giffen, particularly around the Great Darkness Saga. The Great Darkness Saga, which reintroduced Darkseid, brought him in as a central villain in the 30th century. That was incredible. Then, Keith Giffen left the book and was succeeded by Steve Lytle. Steve Lytle had amazing detail uh, and you know, just body anatomy. You know, he made the characters look very heroic. Beautiful women, heroic, epic-looking heroes, great action. The the fourth issue of the deluxe series, uh, Nemesis Kid versus Karate Kid, incredible battle to the death. You know, just brutal and a visceral fist fight between these two fighters. Um, and finally, Paul Levitz and Greg LaRoque. Greg LaRoque was the artist that succeeded Steve Lytle during the 1980s. Greg's pencils were also amazing, similar yet different from Steve Lytle. Greg LaRoque, incidentally, you ever meet him at a Comic Con? Really nice guy. Excellent artist. Uh, he does collections. Uh, he takes uh, uh, donations for various charity work. Um, <clears throat> just an, an awesome human being. I always love to track him down, even if I'm not buying anything. Uh, I don't need an autograph. I just stop for five minutes, say, hey, how are you going? How are things doing? You know, how's the fam? Uh, but he always has something at his table that's really interesting. He's always working on something. And he loves meeting his fan base. He's a nice, humble, grounded guy. Just really incredible. Spend a few minutes with Steve Lytle next chance you get. I'll have to or, I'm sorry, uh, Greg LaRoque. Well, Greg Steve LaRoque. Lytle, too, if you ever get yeah. to meet him. But Greg LaRoque, definitely. I'll have to do so. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, yeah, almost the entire, I would honestly say Legion of Superheroes for me, almost in its entirety from 1980 to 1991. Just, just suck it all down. <laughs> all right. Well, so I, uh, I decided, I saw that this was the last issue of Thunderbolts, and I thought, you know what, I've li liked Thunderbolts, both this version and the previous version, um, the previous series. I guess this, the previous series was actually two series, because mm -hmm. uh, there was a kind of a break in it. Um, mm. And I thought, oh, this is the final one? Well, now I should start catching up. Uh, well, yeah, you should do that anyway. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, the, uh, the, the, the Punisher versus the Thunderbolts finale here with Red Hulk and... and uh, just uh, everybody, Elektra and, and Deadpool and who else, Ghost Rider. It's uh, kind of a almost a all-star anti-hero cast. I, I don't want to say too much because you are so very far behind. I am. But, uh, <clears throat> there does come a point when the Punisher's vendetta against the Thunderbolts has a has a twist, uh, and I can't wait to see how that twist plays out in this, the final issue. Um, this has been an interesting iteration of the Thunderbolts. They have had more than one iteration through you know from the from their original days when it was Baron Zemo as Citizen V and uh, the rebranded Masters of Evil. Uh, and then just going forward with the Thunderbolts, the new Thunderbolts, uh, Norman Osborn's Thunderbolts, uh, the, the short-lived uh, Luke Cage Thunderbolts, etc. Uh, this, this has been a pretty inter inter interesting iteration of the team. Yeah, to this, the, the, the color-coded <clears throat> color Thunderbolts, which is all red, Largely, and, yeah. all red and black and white all the time. Yeah. Which is kind of a funny way to go, but uh, they, they seem to have made it work. I've only, like I said, I've only uh, read a couple of 
issues of this series. But uh, here we are in issue 32, so hey, I've got a, a nice little chunk to catch up on, oh. which, which is actually how I digested the, the first series of Thunderbolts. I was way behind and then bought a ton. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with that. Of course, the Thunderbolts came out during the time that I was on a hiatus from comics, so uh, that, and it was wonderful how, you know, Fabian De Siza and Mark Bagley and all the guys just managed to keep that all under wraps and then do the big reveal, you know, that it's really Baron Zemo and Goliath and Moonstone and Beetle and the Fixer, and you're like, wow, that was awesome. So these villains are doing this thing now. That's incredible. Um, in any event, I ended up needing, I, I think I sat down and just powered through 30 straight issues of the Thunderbolts because that was how long I had been out of the comic cycle. Um, and it was amazement. It was amazement. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I didn't start until they were probably five years into it. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was. It, they were probably like 60 issues in it. And that first series was, I believe, 100. I mean, I know there was a break in there somewhere, but I right, think they right. went to exactly 100. Uh, what, what, what I've got, what I've gleaned from as far as I've been able to get by reading through actually issue by issue uh, is after issue 76 there is a big change of direction sorry about that yeah so uh, if you're oh, reading and that's when it was the Norman Os Osborne version no 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 that was even well before that because oh, okay. uh, Norman Osborne's group was a complete numerical break um, they okay. uh, they reintroduced the uh, the Citizen V team minus Citizen V at that point uh, Baron Zemo wasn't faking Citizen V anymore but uh, they reintroduced that team around about the same time that they had reintroduced the Avengers as the new Avengers oh right and and those those characters had 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 gotten thrown into the various uh, 50 states initiative Ad Avengers right uh, eventually that would happen but remember the Thunderbolts came about that this this next iteration came about before Civil War happened. Um, so, yeah, this has been running for some time. We're, we're going to have to get you a flow chart. But in this instance, I won't make fun of you for being a We could just confused. put it up on the wall here, maybe on the ceiling. You've got some ceiling space uh, that we could make a big timeline uh, for yeah. the various events. That would be I'll, awesome. Uh, I'll feed you some tequila, and then you'll just hit the floor like you always do, and I'll put the uh, murder board up on the ceiling. Like I always do. <laughs> like he's ever fed me tequila before that I can remember. Mm -hmm. What's your next one, Troy? <laughs> okay. Are you a fan of classic comic characters? I certainly am. Okay. Well, are you a fan of Peter David? I'm a big fan of P Peter David. Okay, then there is absolutely no reason for you to not be buying this. Oh, no. Ba-bam! The Phantom. The Phantom. Wasn't that a movie? The Phantom. Yeah, it was a movie starring Billy Zane and uh, Treat and, Williams. And Penelope Ann Mil Miller? Uh, I believe that was the lead actress, but never mind all that. That's the important it's part. The classic, right? The classic jungle hero, the Phantom, the ghost who walks. He's back in comics, uh, and Peter David's writing them. And if you had been at the Baltimore Comic Con and had sat through the panel on the Phantom, you would also be excited about this. I am extremely excited about the Phantom. I love classic heroes like The Shadow, like Doc Savage, like Flash Gordon, Mandrake the Magician. I love those old newspaper strips and the pulp action heroes. Um, this is why I read Justice Incorporated, uh, which brings me The Shadow and uh, The Avenger and Doc Savage. Uh, this is why I read uh, King's Watch, why I read King's Watch, why I read Flash Gordon. And now I'm adding the Phantom back to that. Um, the Phantom, this is going to be incredible. The action, the artwork is just beautiful. Uh, look at this. Sal Veludo. Uh, this guy showed some panels at the Baltimore Comic Con and the panels that he put up. Beautiful stuff. The action in here is fantastic. What artist does that remind me of? Uh, well, you know, probably a lot of artists with some similar techniques. There's a lot of, there's like some Neil Adams influence Neil in Adams, here. all right, okay, that's, um, that's who I'm thinking of. Salvaluto uh, is looking like Neil Adams to me, and I'm liking it. Yeah. Because it, it really, it really, uh applies well to this style of comic. It does. It really does. So uh, if you're into something a little off from the mainstream of superhero, a hero with a lengthy history, with uh, just... Uh, amazing worldwide appeal. Uh, the Phantom comics are very popular in Europe, for example. Uh, you should pick this up. And if you like Peter David, and yeah, I'm talking about Star Trek novelist Peter David, Incredible Hulk Peter David, uh, uh, X Factor Peter David, that Peter David, Aquaman, Atlantis, uh, yeah, the Atlantis Chronicles. You remember that one? What is he doing now? He just started another Marvel thing, didn't he? 
Ah, uh, jeez, you, you had to floor me with that now. It, um, or it might have been it might have been an independent thing. But anyway, Peter David, he's everywhere, uh, and he's amazing. And he's on the Phantom. And he's on so the Phantom. Pick that up. He's on that one with uh, J.K. Simmons. Doesn't matter. Anyway, <laughs> moving right along here. <laughs> Some image book, I think. Maybe I'm not sure. Hey, here, speaking of things that are popular, Guardians of the Galaxy is popular as anything these days, uh, particularly in the cinematic universe. Good effort there. And I, I like to get get a little little uh, little bit of a segue happening. Oh look, Drax and Nova chasing each other. What the heck? Anyway, Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, I loved them before it was cool. Which, by the way, I'm really glad that it is cool because, hey, more Guardians of the Galaxy for me. Uh, yeah, I was a fan of the new iteration of the Guardians of the Galaxy from Annihilation Conquest coming on up to now. Uh, I picked up everything that they've been in, but also from Annihilation. Nova. Uh, I had gotten the Drax the Destroyer series back yeah. in, uh, what was that, 2004, 2005? It's a four issue mini series. Like uh, that. Yeah, it, and it was, it was very, very good. It was a slow build up back to the intergalactic heroes I don't of think I Marvel. Got, I don't think I got more than that first issue. What I wanted to say wanted, with, with regard to Guardians of the Galaxy is I finally did read that Guardians 3000 that we highlighted uh, a couple of weeks ago, and oh my goodness, it was my pick, right? Uh, it was fantastic, wasn't it? I it mean, was fantastic, and I'm like, you, you you read through the whole thing, and you're like, wait, what? What's going on here? Yeah. Oh, oh, I have to read the next one. I I want to I want it in my hands right now, but it's going to be you know weeks. Just as and, and see, I, I kind of wish I'd known that we were actually going to get into talking about this because I would have also worn my uh, Guardians of the Galaxy star. I have that cloisonne pin from Planet Studios back in 1989. Nice. Yeah, I still got nice. that. Nice. So just as the Legion of Superheroes represent superheroes in the 30th century for DC, the Guardians of the Galaxy represent the the Marvel Universe, a possible future in the 31st century. Because um, Marvel's more advanced. <clears throat> or well, something. I don't know that that's quite When it comes to, no, that's not really a thing. <laughs> I just like to say stuff like that. But it was great to see uh, Major Victory, you know, Vance Astro, and Charlie 27, and Starhawk. I really want to know what we're going to do with Starhawk, Stackar, and Aleda. What's going to happen with that dynamic? I'm curious as to where Nicolette Gold is. You know, where's our flame-headed Mercurian? Right. I, I don't think they've gotten rid of her, but I didn't see her right away. It's like, no. you know, where is she? What's going on here? Not in that um, episode or issue. And and that's <clears throat> and, and the, who is this new person? Was she ever in anything else before? I don't remember her from the earlier series, but it has actually been the balance of more than eight years since I've read that series, which I loved and read nearly to completion. Um, I, I'm only missing a few issues out of that, uh, you know, that the Jim Valentino run of uh, of the Guardians of the Galaxy, which ran about 62 issues, and, and if I remember correctly. This new series seems like a, a, a very... Uh, Space piratey, desperate, not quite having their stuff together right, team, right. like like this uh, modern cin cinematic uh, lineup of of uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, this this contemporary uh, team. Uh, that sort of feel, whereas the the, uh, the the classic Guardians of the Galaxy didn't really have that feel. They were more the the Space Avengers. Well, yes, but now remember, the first half of their existence, they were trying to liberate Earth from the Badoon, and once they actually got that up and running, they were always almost almost always outnumbered by whatever menace that they were facing. And aside from Starhawk, they weren't really a powerhouse team. It's not until much later into the 1990s. When we start to introduce, uh, we reintroduce some of the Marvel Universe characters in their future incarnations, like Fire Lord. Uh, we see um, a future incarnation of the Phoenix Force inhabiting a different mutant human. We see uh, the Spirit of Vengeance inhabiting a different uh, humanoid alien as Ghost Rider on some far flung planet. Uh, it. Uh, it, it just gave us so much of the Marvel Universe that we did recognize, but continued to drop on us new things. And Valentino's artwork was very energized. It was, it was exciting. It was dynamic. It was something that you wanted to keep reading month by month. This current series, Guardians 3000, has a lot of those things. Starting a little bit smaller, though, taking some of the characters' wherewithal away and kind of giving them that edge of desperation, which actually makes the series a little more compelling. So let's uh, let's see how this unfolds. So yes, Guardians of the Galaxy, 
21st century, Guardians 3000, 31st century. You should be reading them both like I am. And and this is number 20, and this is a uh, an original sin tie-in. original tie sin tie-in, yes. There's still some fallout from the events of original sin, which have not completely played out yet. Um, some of these things are probably going to be dealt with for quite some time. It'll be a little interesting to see how much of it butts up against what's currently going on with Axis, but I don't want to talk about that just yet, because I'm going to jump over to the independent side of comics. The last thing that I have to say about this is uh, it remains. The fact remains, we are grouped. All right. <laughs> that was good, Kevin. Thank that you. was good. All right. Your okay. next one, indie stuff. Independent publisher Avatar Press. Now, they put out a lot of comics that I am just over the moon about. Some of my favorites from Avatar have included Caliban, uh, a hard nuts and bolts science fiction with a little bit of an aliens and disaster edge feel to it. You should check that out. Uh, Uber, uh, set in World War II, it involves uh, 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 Kieran Gillen writing and it involves uh, Nazi super soldiers. Um, God is Dead, uh, which is a modern fantasy mega epic, um, neatly encapsulated in one book so you don't have a whole lot of crossover. And it's just raw and brutal at places. Uh, it involves all the mythological gods, but it's just much darker and edgier than, say, something like Fables, which I like for different reasons. Um, Avatar has put something else out now that's got some of the things that I like at several of their other titles. And there it is, ladies and gentlemen, Dark Gods number one. Um, that's the cover with the Cthulhu-esque monster on it, right? Right, you know, the, and, I, the, and I have the many found headed, a page that wasn't, uh, that wasn't it, too edgy. That wasn't too edgy. A yeah. little bit edgy, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Let me just warn uh, you know, warn the readers right now, warn our viewers. Uh, Avatar books, by and large, are all for mature readers only. This is uh, definitely... They, that, they will have some edgy violence. They could possibly have nudity, sexual situations, other mature themes. So they are not an all-ages book. It is not something something for the kids to get into. But if you are, in fact, that older, more sophisticated reader, if you like that stuff that's just ramped up more, uh, then Avatar is a company where you should check out more of their stuff, and Dark Gods is definitely a book that you should look at. Um, I love these things with uh, supernatural themes and, uh, you know, folklore and myth mythological monsters, you know, gods of all kinds. That sort of thing just appeals to me, and you know, it could be God is Dead, it could be Thor, God of Thunder, uh, it could be you know, on the DC side, uh, Pandora and the Trinity of Sin. Uh, but that's the kind of thing I like, and I think you should check it out because you'll like this too. The artwork inside, as you just saw, was absolutely wonderful, um, but it will have ramped up violence. If that's the kind of thing that bothers you, then this may not be the book for you, otherwise. Come check this out. Check it out with me here in the store. Watch me get excited and feed off of that. All right. So, uh, like I say, this, this week I'm all Marvel all the time. So let's look at some other Marvel, shall we? If this were a zombie apocalypse, Kevin would be a Marvel zombie. I would be a Marvel <clears throat> zombie. Anyway, so here we've got the 75th anniversary celebration. Here we've got the 75th anniversary celebration. Um... And uh, we've got this is this is a lot of stuff all in one book, a lot of stuff all in one book. I'm talking here, um, and uh, we've got little little clips from things like Alias. Um, so uh, and and I really wanted to see uh, see things like that. I really wanted to see things like that. <laughs> Thanks, Mark, for for uh, checking out the uh, the audio for us here. Uh, yes, cameraman, operator, producer, director, uh, all around nice guy, Mark Lutz. All around nice guy. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And Groot, attorney at law. Look at that. That's cute. Um, for those people who don't know, uh, while Marvel, the Marvel Age of Comics officially begins in 1961, which was not 75 years ago. No. Uh, Marvel was previously a company known as Atlas, and Atlas was previously known as Timely. And in 1939, Timely Comics gave us Marvel, Marvel Comics, Comics number, number one. one. 
Marvel Comics number one debuted the Submariner, the Human Torch, Kazar the Great, the Angel, uh, dropped a lot of awesomeness on us. And from there going forward, Namor, the Submariner, and the Human Torch, uh, art by Carl Burgos. And Toro. Uh, and, well, yes, and Toro, the Human Torch and Toro. But uh, they would go on to join Captain America and become Marvel's trinity. They, they, these are the big three. They're top-selling characters. They were in their own books. They were in Marvel Comics. They were in USA Comics. They were in uh, all select comics. I mean, they were they were everywhere. When people th- you know, think today, a character like Spider-Man or Wolverine, how many titles do they have? Back in 19, the 19, late 1930s, 1940s, you know, once Cap comes along, here is an example of a popular character spilling into more than one book because the public demand Man's more. I mean, they're. Think about this. Comics like that back then. Captain America had a pr- Captain America number one had a print run of almost a million copies. Action uh, Action Comics, Marvel Comics number one had a print run. I want to say it was over eight hundred and fifty thousand copies. That's a lot o comic compared to today. Oh my! This. Yeah, yeah. I mean that. Yeah, I, I, I'm seeing a lot of interest. Okay, wait. This in is this, this is this is a this is an anthology. I think this is new. I think that Alias is new. Yes, it's a new story. Okay, so I am a huge Alias fan. Uh, Brian Michael Bendis and um, uh, Michael Gatos um, did the Alias series uh, in the or what did they start uh, around around 2000 somewhere about somewhere thereabouts. Um, Sounds about right. For the uh, the short-lived Marvel, uh, their version of uh, of DC's Vertigo was Marvel Max. Yeah, uh, Marvel Max actually persists. It's still a thing today. Really? Uh, unless you're thinking of Marvel Knights. No, I'm thinking of Marvel Max. Okay. Is, is Marvel Max around? What in the heck is Marvel Max today? Uh, at this moment in time, there is not a published Max title, but, but it's, recently it's... there had been, uh, before this current Nathan Edmondson series, there had been The Punisher. Uh, it ended earlier in the year, but there had been a Wolverine Max series. Max is still around. They just don't use it as heavily for things. Anyway, I yeah. was a huge fan, and it was that was the Marvel that I wanted to see. Uh, I, I wanted to see actual costume super superheroes in in, a, in adult situations, but you know, and but clearly marked as adults, not these uh, kind of halfway jokes. Oh, the adults will get it and think it's something, and the kids will just <laughs> think it's action. Not stuff like that, but actual like you know, in the second issue of Alias, um, uh, Jessica Jones has a uh, very successful first. State with um, uh, Power Man, uh, Luke, Luke Cage, Cage. and uh, and the, the the two of them really get along well, and are married today, and are married today. So yes, with a daughter, Danielle. Oh yeah, yeah, good times. Mm-hmm. But uh, but yeah, uh, Alias has been uh, a, a, a favorite of mine, and so I'm excited to read a new Alias uh, story. And then it looks like there's there's uh, something from Several. Stan Lee. Uh, yeah, got, well, there's Captain America foils a traitor's revenge. Uh, Bruce Tim and Stan Lee are the storytellers. Uh, anniversary looks like James Robinson, novelist James Robinson, awesome. Uh, Len Wein and Paul Gillespie. Oh, that's going to be incredible. So yeah, it's an interesting anthology. Come celebrate Marvel's 75th anniversary with that. Um, we've got that here in the I'm store. I'm excited. I, I thought this was just going to be a bunch of uh, reprints. You know, reprints and then some ads. Oh, here's what's going on in Marvel today. No, no this is no, no, this no, is no. an anthology. This is a truly a 75th anniversary celebration. I apologize, Marvel, for doubting you. <laughs> How could I after today's announcements, which we will get to later? Part two. Okay. So, next up on my hit list... Hmm. <clears throat> A small independent company called Black Mass, and they put out some other things uh, like uh, The Last Born and Critical Hit, uh, and, and numerous other titles. I won't go on and give you the resume, but God Killer. God Killer looks really, really interesting, and I got to show you the back you cover like here. That back cover. Yeah, that back cover is also this. This thing looks it looks really cool. I mean, I was going through the book, you know, trying to get a feel for it, and you know, there's uh, the. I, I like this style of art. You know, I, I like this. It's different from your traditional comic line art. Um, not really cartoony, but a little more I- expressionistic, maybe. Um, there's just some fairly minimalist pages. Uh, there's, you know, just some some 
vibrant in the red. There's something about it. It just you really seems to, to set a mood. It, it sets, I, I was gonna say I, I thought I, I thought I would be disappointed when I saw that the interior wasn't the Ben Templesmith that you see on the cover. But after seeing the interiors, I'm like, oh, this is still good. This is good stuff. Yes, indeed. So again, <clears throat> I always like to keep my eye out for uh, comics that have uh, a strong supernatural theme to them. Uh, I like to see comics that incorporate um, you know mythologies, uh, religious folklore, that kind of thing. Which is why I love books like Neil Gaiman's Sandman. You know, again, I I, I can't. Help but mention Jason Aaron's Thor, God of Thunder. You said it right uh, that time. I said what? Neil Gaiman. Did I say Neil Gaiman? You said it. And, you, you said it right this time. He's he's going to be confused and not listen to our show anymore. I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Gaiman. If you still feel the need to punch me in the face, and come right on ahead. All right, but but go ahead. Um, but, you know, so books that have themes like that, I look for. And God Killer appears to be at one of those books with that type of theme. Uh, I was looking at things like uh, Dark Ages from Dark Horse. Uh, and, uh, you know, of course, I mentioned already God is Dead from Avatar. That kind of thing just appeals to me. And so Ragnarok? Think, yeah, Ragnarok by Walt Simonson, you know, an IDW piece of amazement. So, uh, yes. Come pick this up. Black Mask, God Killer, issue number one. There are variant covers. I'm not going to waste your time and show you them all right now. Three different variant but covers, Three though. different variant covers. Uh, they all look good. I think this one is going to be mine, though. So um, uh, you can't have this one. <laughs> Troy's, and, and Troy's got a bunch here, so don't eat... Just, Get in Mark, here while Mark you still is, can. Uh, Mark here is poking the bear. He is <laughs> teasing to, the gorilla in the monkey house. Trying to steal that te uh, Devilsmith cover. <laughs> uh, yes, indeed. I, I will use my flight ring and zoom over there, and I will give you some what for. <laughs> All caps. What for? All right. So, Kev, what you got for me next? Uh, you know, I'm behind on things. You might know this, but uh, I'm behind on things, including Fantastic Four. I love Fantastic Four and Spider-Man, even though their uh, their movie rights are held by Sony. I, I sure hope. I sure hope that that Marvel. I was hoping today that Marvel was going to introduce some some great news, like oh, by the way, we're get, we've got a we've got a plan, and we're gonna we're gonna co-create with with Sony. That was not yet announced. We're fans. We're still holding our, our we're crossing our fingers, and Fantastic Four is still on the way out. But I, James Robertson Robinson, uh, still writing. Um, it's it's got to be still good. Here's the least you need to know. Since the events of Original Sin, a very dark secret has come out that has impacted the friendship between the Thing and the Human Torch and Mr. Fantastic. Uh, the Invisible Woman What's and Mr. Fantastic. Oh. What's the secret? No, no, I want to no. know the secret. Then you're going to have to read the comic. I read the annual the, yeah, the other day. No, no, the one no, with this, Valeria? That was yeah. the annual, right? Yes. That was pretty good. It, it, it was. I still so, don't like those red costumes. Oh, and what's the deal with, with Sue? Uh, and you know, uh, Victor's like, "Hey, Sue. Um, hello." Uh, and then he drops a little bomb on her, and she's like, uh, "I'm leaving then." Yeah. See, Kev here has got to like sit down and go do a big read and get caught up on all the tiny details. Um, the state of New York has re has decided that the Fantastics are not providing a safe, stable environment for their children, so their children were removed by the court. Uh, Last time they moved to Connecticut. Yeah, this is yeah, and that didn't work out very well. Um, so in any event, uh, the Invisible Woman is missing her children, and you know she is not someone to be trifled with. Uh, Reed Richards is getting involved in a project because Reed just can't sit around and do nothing. It's not who he is as a person. Ben Grimm is currently found himself in prison. Uh, Johnny Storm has found himself lacking his powers. Uh, there have been a lot of things going on in James Robinson's run on this book, not least of which are the red costumes, which I'm actually finding I don't mind. The red is fine. It, it, I, it, <clears throat> a lot of people uh, complain about, about costume changes. Well, yeah, I would prefer a classic FF costume. I mean, ultimately, it's the writing that matters. Yeah, it is. And James Robinson is doing something really incredible with the team and sort of advancing them. And here's here's something to take note of, uh, to sort of just keep intellectually while you're thinking about this. You might be thinking to yourself, didn't they already do a story with the Fantastic Four where they had to go to court and prove that they were actually good parents providing a safe, stable environment? Haven't we already done this? That was decades ago. Not 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 decades. It was within the last 10 years. Really? Yes, it was. Oh. Uh, have you, did you ever read four? No, you didn't. Oh, my God. What is your problem? So in any event, yeah, 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 yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. James Robinson 
as you read the book... The Marvel Knights one. Yes. Marvel Knights 4? Yeah, I read it. Yes. I've got them all, I think. As you're reading this book, James Robinson goes on mouthpiecing Reed Richards. Or Reed says, there's something funny about how quickly all this was fast-tracked. There's something funny about how all of these things have come up all at once. It's almost as if someone is manipulating a situation. James Robinson's not done with the story yet, people. So don't give up on it. Don't tell yourself, oh, I've already seen this before. No, you have not. If you have any confidence in James Robinson, star man. Uh, All you have to say is is star man. Star man was amazing. It was. It really, truly was. Uh, Justice uh, Justice Society, uh, or JSA. I'm trying to remember if it was JSA or Justice Society. But regardless... You, you, you know what James Robinson is capable of. It's been incredible. This is one more incredible thing to pounce on top of. Fantastic Four, issue number 12. There we go. So, yep, that was Kev's pick, but notice how I sold that for him. He Like every week, most <clears throat> of my picks he does. Uh, so you've actually got a Marvel pick, Troy. I do, I do. And I picked this because the series is really worth talking about to everybody that will listen. So we all know that uh, Charles Soule did the Death of Wolverine 4-issue limited series, and now that series is concluded. Logan is dead. Uh You might not have read it yet, so I won't spoil how it happens, who is responsible, what the moment is like. Maybe you've read some online reviews. Maybe you've seen some uh, artwork, you know, now that the book has been released. But I'm not going to ruin the ride for you. Wolverine is, however, dead. And there was a certain quiet dignity to his death. Uh, If you're expecting Wolverine to go down fighting 10,000 ninjas or something, no, it doesn't happen that way. But this This is not a Frank Miller joint. No, it's a different kind of Frank Miller joint. Because remember, not every Frank Miller character dies in impossible odd situations. But it does, like I said, it has a certain quiet dignity to it. Wolverine goes out as Wolverine would go out. It makes logical sense how it happens. And it, it's poignant. There, there's, there's a dramatic moment in it. Read it and, and enjoy your moment there. And then jump over and start reading The Death of Wolverine, The Legacy of Logan. Or the Logan Legacy, I'm sorry. I keep calling it the Legacy of Logan, but it's actually the Logan Legacy. The Logan Legacy focuses on the Wolverine support cast. So you will see X-23, you will see Dakin, you will see Sabretooth. Add Sabretooth, let me show you the cover. Sabretooth is featured on the cover this month. This is the third installment of the Logan Legacy. Um... Let me see if I could find you something that doesn't necessarily ruin it. The interior, yeah, yeah, the interior artwork, oh, it's just beautiful. So here, let me uh, let me just give you a, it's Kyle Higgins, writer. Let me, you know what, let me stop for just five seconds. I got to talk about Kyle Higgins. Kyle Higgins is an amazing writer. Maybe you're checking out his book from Image right now. It's called Cowl. Maybe you're familiar with his earlier film uh, film piece, uh, The League. Maybe you read Nightwing. Maybe you read Deathstroke, uh, both of those he did for DC's New 52. But Kyle Higgins is... A, a really nice guy, and B, a very talented writer. Uh, I like the way that he makes the story unfold. I like the takes that he has on characterization. So I'm really, truly showing that page, Gav. Oh, look at this. But, okay, so let me show you two pages here from uh, from Mr. Marks. We've got we, we've got we've got that that splash page there, right? That's a nice splash. That's a nice splash splash page. But then we've got this other one. That is amazing because uh, Mr. Marx Kevin is like, says it's amazing. Says, "Oh wait!" And look at this bottom corner. Look at this bottom corner here, Mark. You see that bottom corner where his, where his fingers are, right there, huh? We've got uh, we've got a little Jim Lee just just rip and paste into there. <laughs> He's like, "Oh yeah, some old X Men comics. I'm gonna just rip those out and put them into my comic because this is the legacy of Logan or." The Logan Legacy, depending yep. on how you decide to dist- describe it. So, Wolverine's death will have an emotional resonance for all of these different characters, and obviously no two of them will feel precisely the same way for all of the reasons that they do. X-23 is processing her lack of grief. Storm, on the other hand, is processing a very deep kind of grief. Um, Wolverine, or Sabretooth here... I don't really think Sabretooth will grieve, but there's definitely stuff for Sabretooth to work through. Um, 
it, it's it's been going good up to this point. It's going to keep going good. So yeah, Wolverine is gone now, but there's plenty to explore for the Wolverine support cast. And the death of Wolverine, Logan Legacy number three, is a good place to pounce into this. You think it's something where where Sabretooth is like, ah, I really want, I, I've always wanted to kill that guy. How come somebody else got to kill him? Well, you know, that makes a little bit of sense, but let's not discount the fact that Sabretooth is actually capable of greater introspection than what we might have seen previous to now. True enough. Um, he, he, ha he has been a deeper character, but often he's written as, oh, he's just angry and wants to kill Wolverine all the time, 24 7. Uh, yeah. You know. Yeah. So, uh, so, yeah. Yeah. So, those are my picks. I've got a final pick. You got a final pick. My final pick, and and I, I wanted to pick this not just because I wanted to see this, but look at this interior. This is just an ad in here. Cap, 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 cap. What, what, what? Cap. what? First, tell them what your pick is. My pick is Sixes. I mean Axis. My, I mean Axis, Brittany. Um, just kidding. She's a wonderful. Uh, uh, this is this is Axis Revolutions. Yeah. Um, number one, and so this is a separate title from from Axis, and uh, this is uh, this has got a little bit of kind of like the side story of what's going on during the whole uh, Axis stuff, and we've got some Spider-Man in here, and we've got some Doctor Strange in here, and Doctor Strange is uh, is is part of our news for part two here later today. Yes, indeed. Uh, uh, there's some excitement there with that uh, that particular announcement. But but here, but wait, what was oh, that? I'm, I'm I, I was trying to. Seventy five years from pulp to pop, Tuesday, November fourth on ABC. This is what I wanted to show people on television because I'm you know I'm the TV guy. Um, hey, we've got a, a Marvel retrospective to to watch on TV, and I'm not just talking about uh, Agents of Shield. No, although that is also worth talking about. So that'll but, be fun to watch. Yeah, I suspect that's going in the DVR, and I'm going to have to check it out a day or two after the fact. But Me that too. Will definitely but still, happen. but that'll be fun. To, you know, ABC, November 4th. Check it out, folks. Uh, for those of you who don't already know or who are wondering what is this access all about, and I won't go into it at great length, you know, really, you know, if you really want to, really, truly want to know what a book is all about, the, the best way to do that is to pick it up and read it cover to cover, bell to bell. However, long story slightly shorter, Access involves the Red Skull with a weaponized brain of Professor Xavier. So the Red Skull has access to Xavier's telepathic powers. And now, following the failed attempt to kill him by Magneto, the Red Skull has accessed the dark aspect of Xavier's persona, Onslaught. So now he is Red Onslaught. It is the Red Skull wearing the Onslaught armor with access to Professor Xavier's powers. Fighting the X-Men, fighting the Avengers, this is incredible. It is a classic good versus evil, because Marvel doesn't have very many villains more evil than the Red Skull. Heroes on one side, villain of great epic magnitude on the other. What more do you want? Yeah, it's uh, it's a big one. And uh, it, it just makes my skin crawl every time anybody says Xavier. You're not the only one who does it. I know there are a ton of people who say it. It's Xavier. There's no E. It doesn't start with an E. There's no vowel before the X. What's wrong with you people? Ah, uh, what ifs. But anyway, that's my pick. It looks really cool. I, and I like Spider-Man, and I like Doctor Strange, and I'm excited to read it. So there. Uh-huh. That, is that comics for this week? That's comics for this week. All right. All right. Hey, follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook. And subscribe to us on YouTube. And check uh, check me out, uh, com uh, comicsonline.blip.tv. See you next TV. time. Thank See you next you week. so much. From leaking tall builders to going off like Yamaha bombs. Switch your internet browser to comicsonline.com.